Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. I want to look at, starting in verse 32, the absolute necessity of prayer. The absolute, absolute necessity. It is absolutely necessary to pray. In Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 32, the great revival in Galilee is starting. Jesus has moved to Capernaum. He's moved his headquarters to Capernaum. He's called his apostles to full-time service in this chapter. They've known him for a year. Now they're really starting to get to know him. He's going to teach them some things that they absolutely need to know about prayer. Starting in verse 32, at evening when the sun, sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Wow. That's what I call God. The whole city came. So that would be like having a citywide revival in Amarillo meeting at Dick Bivens Stadium, and there wasn't enough seating because so many people came that there was standing room only at that gigantic stadium. That would be what would be like in Amarillo, Texas, when God starts to move. People were getting saved by the hundreds. They were accepting Christ. Demons were being cast out. People were being healed at this time. I mean, it is an amazing moving of the Holy Spirit of God in great power. And the whole city had gathered together at the door. And they were there well past midnight. And everybody is so excited. God is really moving. And the Spirit of God is just overwhelmingly there. Verse 35, now in the morning. Having risen a, a great while before daylight, Jesus went out and departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. So... This is going to go on well, well into the night as all the city comes and he deals with each one of them and his apostles help him deal individually with each one of them. I don't know if you've ever been to a Billy Graham or Franklin Graham crusade or festival. And we want you to be counselors here and it's listed in your bulletin if you want to come and be counselor trained. The times are in your bulletin. We're going to, as a church, we're going to try to come to those next two counseling or training sessions so you can be counseled. You just have to go to one. They're asking you to go to one counseling session, one training session, so you can become counselors at the Franklin Graham Festival. And it's listed in your bulletin, so please go ahead and register for that. We want all of you to be counselors. You all are ready. They're going to give you great training for it. But if you've ever been to one of those things, after it's over and people are starting to leave, these hundreds and thousands of people that come to be saved, we take them into another room, into another humongous room or barn, and we deal with each one of them individually and separately until every person has been dealt with individually by a counselor. That's what was going on after the crowd left the house, after the crowd left Peter's house. These apostles are dealing individually with these people who have come to accept Christ, who have come to meet with Christ, and it goes way into the night. And then the next morning, what does Jesus do in verse 35? A great while before day, what does he do? He goes out to pray by himself. He goes out to pray. And there he prayed. Would you underline it? There he prayed. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They couldn't find him. But they're up at the crack of dawn because they're so excited. I mean, if you want to see the Spirit of God move, that's exciting stuff. And they're searching for him, they're looking for him, and they found him. Verse 37, the Greek word, found him. Eureka! They found him. And they said to him, everyone's looking for you, we've got to get going. Now the last part's not in the King James. 
Everyone is looking for you. We've got to get back to this mission. We've got to get back over there. People are getting saved. They're wanting to talk to you. The whole town is back and they're searching for you. It's 8 o'clock in the morning and the town's back and they're wanting you. We've got to get... What are you doing here? They're over there. We need to get this ministry going. The revival is starting. Eureka! Now you're going to love what Jesus says. Verse 39. But he said to them, Let us go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I've come forth. Now, what's he been doing? What's he been out there doing by himself? Praying. He's been out there spending time with the Father. He's been out there spending time with his God. This is a, a great responsibility. The revival is starting in Galilee. And for the next year in Galilee, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are going to come to the Lord. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands are going to receive Christ. Their lives are going to be changed. Homes are going to be rescued. Lepers are going to be healed. People are going to be raised from the dead. This is a tremendous, unbelievable moving of the Holy Spirit of God. And it's just now starting. It's going to start right here at his headquarters in Capernaum. And Peter and the apostles realize this. They see what's going on. And they say, Lord, we've got to get back into the work. It's 8 o'clock. It's time for coffee breaks over. We've got to get, get back. And Jesus says one of the most unbelievable things. We're not going back. We're going to do something different. We're going to go to some other towns. Now, I want you to mark this spot. I want you to hold it. Use one of your Bible markers or use a piece of paper or something. And I want you to turn to the right with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8. And we're going to start in verse 5. There's another story almost just like this later on. After Jesus had been crucified and resurrected and ascended into heaven, there's another story in the church almost exactly like this. There's going to be a great revival over in the city of Samaria. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, that doesn't say the multitude, that's multitudes plural. Thousands upon thousands. Multitudes, plural. Thousands upon thousands with one accord. He did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. And there's this gigantic, unbelievable revival that breaks out among the Samaritans. Thousands upon thousands, multitudes upon multitudes are coming to hear the gospel and getting saved. And the Spirit of God is moving in such an unbelievable, mighty way. And while that is going on in verse 26, so when they testified, I'm sorry, verse 25, when they testified and preached the word of God, the apostles had come down from Jerusalem and they got in on it, and they testified and preached the Word of God. They're in on it. The great preachers come to the revival. Verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. While this is going on, and while everything is exciting and full of joy, the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, to the desert. This is desert. Luke said, it's nothing but desert. And the Spirit of God says, I want you to go down and I want you to go to a road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza, the desert road. I want you to leave this tremendous revival. I want you to leave the mighty moving of the Holy Spirit of God. And I want you to go to this desert road. Now, who's the main premier preacher of this revival? Philip. 
Who's God talking to right here? Philip. So I want you to go to the desert. So he arose, verse 27, I like this part. He arose and went. And behold, a man. One. Now what we just read about was multitudes upon multitudes upon multitudes are moving for God. And now what we read here is there was a man. One. It's the eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch. And as he's going along there, he's reading the scriptures, and Philip says, walks up to the chariot, and he said, do you know what you're reading? He said, how can I, except somebody explained it to me. And Philip leads this one guy, this one guy to the Lord. However, you need to know this. This one guy was the prime minister of Ethiopia. He was the head of the government of Ethiopia. God knew where he was, and God knew how important it was, and God asked Philip to leave this tremendous, mighty moving, this powerful moving of God, this excitement and this great joy that's in Samaria. And he told him, I want you to go over to the desert road to this man right over here. Now go back with me to Mark, because the same thing is happening right here. Verse 37, they found him. And they said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said, that's not where God wants me. I must go to the next towns and I may preach there also. Because for this purpose I've come forth. Where had Jesus just come when they found him? Where did they find him? Praying. How did he know that he was supposed to leave this mighty moving of God to go someplace else God told him now what we want to talk about this morning for just a minute is the absolute necessity of prayer the absolute necessity of prayer so that we can find out God's plan for us because we have a plan however God has a plan we have our timing God's got his timing we have a purpose. God's got His purpose. And we want to make sure that our plan is God's plan and our timing is God's timing and our purpose is God's purpose. And the only way we can do that is if we get to know God and we hear Him speak to us. And we look at these circumstances and we say, well, this, is, this must be what God wants us to do. But we haven't spent enough time with God to know what he wants and so god is out there jesus is out there and he's spending time with him now go back with me to verse 35 in the morning having risen a great while before day i want you to underline these two words having risen he went out and he prayed but the word having risen is the same word that's used of jesus's resurrection Now, what happens when we learn how to pray, what happens when we spend time with God, is it has the same effect as the resurrection of our physical body. When we learn how to pray, and we learn how to spend time with God, and we learn how to take time to be with God, we start to learn who He is, and we, spark, we get to know Him, and God's Holy Spirit gets to know us and he lives in us and God is with us and he's in us and as we learn how to pray it has the exact same effect as a physical resurrection this is the exact same word as when Jesus resurrected from the tomb and having risen a great while before sunlight he goes to pray what prayer does for us is it resurrects the church. Now, one of the things that's happening in the United States today, and the reason we're going through what we're going through, is the church is dead. We're saved. We're believers. But there's no life in us. There's no life in the church. 
I told you a while ago, it's time to have church stop laughing and stop smiling and quit having a good time. It's church time. Now, oh my goodness. We don't want that to really take place. But what happens when we pray is we have the same effect. When we really learn how to pray and spend a little bit of time with God, it has the same effect as a resurrection. And it resurrects our homes. It resurrects us. It resurrects the church of God when the church learns how to pray. Now, what we're looking at here is great things are happening inside of Capernaum. And great things are happening over in Samaria. A lot of things are happening. But what God wants is us. And He's going to teach us how to pray. He's going to show us the absolute necessity of prayer. Now, what we're going to see here in these few verses, we're just doing 35 through 39. Verse 39, And he was preaching in the synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Okay, there's three things that happen when we pray. God tells us when. God tells us where. God tells us what. He told Jesus, I want you to go to the rest of Galilee today. And they just left that morning. They just got up and left. The revival is still going on in Capernaum. He tells you when. He told him where. Where, where are they headed? Where are they headed? To the rest of the synagogues in Galilee. Isn't, isn't that what he said? We're going to go on a, on a tour. We're going to go to the rest of the synagogues in Galilee. And he tells you where. He's going to tell you when. He's going to tell you where. He's going to tell you what. L watch this. Verse 39, what's he doing? He's preaching and casting out demons. One of the things that prayer does is it deals on a spiritual level that we are unfamiliar with. In fact, we usually, all we see is the physical level. And we see what's happening physically, but we are unaware of what's happening under the surface spiritually. Now, as Jesus is praying and going about this mighty moving of God throughout Galilee, all of Galilee. You see, it's a whole lot bigger than the apostles saw. What the apostles saw was Capernaum. But what Jesus saw was something bigger. God's always got something bigger than what we see. But we only learn about it through prayer. It only happens through prayer. We see what's going on and we see small. And, and I would love to see Amarillo come to Christ. Goodness gracious, can you imagine if Amarillo came to Christ? But you know what? God sees a state. God sees a nation. God sees the world. And that's only going to happen if we learn how to pray. There is a spiritual undertone here as he's casting out demons. Do you think God's call, Jesus' call, he came just to cast out demons out of people? No. The United States hasn't really ever seen anything quite like this because we've been a Christian nation. Israel hasn't been a believing nation for years. They've been studying the rabbis and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're very religious, but none of them are saved. When you get really, 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 really religious without Christ, you're worshiping somebody besides God. But here's what Jesus is showing. This is the whole point of this thing. There is a spiritual warfare underneath that can only be won through prayer. And one of the things that's happening in our nation today is a spiritual underneath thing that nobody's even aware of, including the Christians, but God is. And God says the only way you're going to win this is through prayer. There's a spiritual battle going on. Now, I want you to keep, keep it marked because we'll come back to Mark. But I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And we want to take a look at this for just a moment. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 10. The absolute necessity of prayer.
When, where, what? Well, let me tell you about the what. There is a spiritual battle going on underneath the surface that's completely invisible that we don't even see. Paul's going to talk about this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. That power is prayer. In the power of His might, not my might. In the power of His strength, not my strength. If we're going to let God do it, we're going to tap into His power and His strength, and that's through prayer. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This really isn't a physical battle. If we're going to win our, our city to Christ, we're going to win our state to Christ, we're going to win our nation to Christ, this is not a physical battle. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And that word wrestle is not just talking about a wrestling match. This is talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat with two soldiers seeing who's going to survive. Each one of them's got a knife pulled out. And whichever one of them's been trained the best is the one that's going to win this wrestling match and the other one's going to die. This is not a wrestling contest. This is not big-time wrestling. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat between military. And we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we're going to wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now hang on, we're going there. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your... Having, your, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, the helmet of salvation. Verse 18. Where's the battle? The battlefield is prayer. Don't you be walking around rebuking and the devil Jude says that even the archangel Michael didn't do that you don't have that kind of authority you pray and let God do it look at verse 18 praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful of this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that earnest may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador. Pray for me that I get out of jail so I can go preach. But, but the whole point of this thing is prayer. Now go back with me to Matthew chapter 1, verse 35. And Jesus is going to teach the apostles something that's very, very important. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Simon and those who were with him, while the apostles searched for him, and when they found him, they said, Everybody's looking for you. We've got to get back to, to business. Jesus said, That was yesterday. That was yesterday. Today's another day. We're going to go that way. That was yesterday. We're going to go forward. Don't live in the past. Live in the present. Live in the forward. That was yesterday. We're not going back there. I'll take care of that. I've got that going. Get your eyes off the physical. Let's get them on the spiritual. Here's what I want you to do. This is today. The church is living in the past. We've got to start following Jesus Christ. We've got to start following the Holy Spirit. And this is today, and we've got to follow God. He's marching onward, 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 onward. And He's not living in the past. We've got a whole nation. We've got a whole generation. We've got a whole bunch of new kids that need saved. He said, follow me. We're going to the next churches, to the next generation. This is today. That was yesterday. And he tells us when, where, and what. And the what is a big deal. 
Now here's what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes. How are we going to do this? We've talked about the when, the where, the what. Let's talk about the how. I think this is the important part. How are we going to do this? Well, we're giving you five rocks in these little kids' bags. But what we're teaching the kids, I'm going to teach the church. What we need to know about prayer. Praise. Thanksgiving. Confession. Petition. Asking. And intercession. I'm going to call that kingdom praying. Kingdom praying. Now, we're going to, we're going to learn how... The whole point of prayer is to get to know God. The whole point of prayer is to get to know God. Okay, i got to have you turn one more place. I'm sorry I'm taking you all over the Bible today. But it's a good book. John chapter 14. Verse 17. John 14, 17. I want you to know me. I want you to know the Holy Spirit. I want you to know God. Jesus said, I'm I'm leaving the world. I'm leaving the earth. Physically, I'm going to ascend and go to heaven. But the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, I'm going to leave Him here with you because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him. That is not a statement. You know the Holy Spirit. That's not what Jesus says in the Greek language. This is an imperative command. You know Him. He didn't say, you know Him. He said, you know Him! Exclamation point. Then you go on to verse 19. Well, verse 18, I'll not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer. Verse 19, a little while longer. The world will see me no more. But you, in the Greek, it's imperative command. You see me. Now, he's invisible. So I'm going to have trouble with this one. He's talking about the Holy Spirit of God. You see me, exclamation point. You see me. Now, how are we going to do this? You know me, you see me. Both of them are commands. I want you to know me and I want you to see me. However, you can't see me with your eyes, but I want you to see me. Okay. Five kinds of prayer. Now, when we pray, we're going to have an open Bible. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. The word meditate is nothing in the world but the word conversate, conversation. When we meditate on the Word of God, when we meditate with God, it is a conversation. That's just another word for meditation. Meditation in the world is weird. Put your fingers together and make little circles and hum. Mm, now close your eyes and don't break the circle. Mm, and that is meditation. I showed my Sunday school class today. If you want to get into yoga, you got to get your body in the right spot. And then you take your other leg. And you put, I'll, need, I'll need knee surgery again if I do this. And then you close your eyes and you meditate on the Sanskrit word over and over again. It's the name of one of the Indian gods is what they're meditating. Each one of the words they give you is different, but it's the name of a Sanskrit god. And then you, me- you meditate. On... But that's not God's meditation. The biblical word for meditation, conversation. You're going to talk to God about the Bible. He's going to talk to you about the Bible. You're just going to have this conversation with God. When we pray, we're praying monologue. God doesn't want us to pray monologue. The whole point of prayer is not to get something. It's okay to ask for something. Jesus said it's fine to ask for stuff. He said, I want you to ask for everything. He taught us to pray for our food. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not wrong to ask for stuff. Our problem is we ask for stuff and we never listen to God. We never get to know Him in our prayers. And we pray and we pray and we pray and we never get to know God because we have monologues. We need to meditate. 
We need to have a conversation with God. And every once in a while, I need to shut up and listen to God. And then he can talk to me, and then I'll talk to him. And we pray with an open Bible. We talk to God, and we have this conversation where we actually get to know him. There are five kinds of prayer. Praise and thanksgiving are two of them. Praise and thanksgiving. Psalms 135 talks about how to praise him. Praise God. List his names back to him in the, out of the Bible. We just, God, you are our Father, you are our Savior, you are our Redeemer. You are Father, you are Son, you are Holy Spirit. You are the Holy Spirit that lives in me, the Counselor, the Indweller, the Son of God, the Living Word, the Living Water, the Bread of Life, the Light of the World. And we actually start to get to know who He is. He is the Almighty, Everlasting God. You can't name Him too many times. Praise Him. Then we're going to thank Him. Because all the good stuff that happened in your life yesterday came straight from God. And we're just going to, we're just going to sit down for a minute and think about what He did for us yesterday. I don't know if you know it, but Lake Mead is the lowest it's been since 1937. They're having a horrible drought to the west. The heat's temperatures are just exploding over 100 degrees fires all along the west coast and the wind is out of the north this morning at 10 miles an hour and it's raining on us and i don't know if you know it or not but god is pouring out his blessings and his protection upon us we need to thank him for that and if we stop and take the time we get to know god we're going to praise him we're going to thank him. we're going to confess our sins We need this every morning. We need to confess our sins. Just tell him, Lord, I did this, I did this, I did this. I need your forgiveness. I screwed it up bad. And confess our sins. Confession is a large part of the great men and women of the Bible as they confess their sins. David confesses his sins before God in some horrible stuff. But he confesses it and gives it to God and asks for his forgiveness. We need to do that. We need to ask God for what we need. Give us this day our daily bread and call that petitions. We just ask God, Lord, I need some help at work. I need some help in finances. I need, my, I need clothes. I need, and we ask him for stuff. It's fine. And then lastly, that kingdom praying. There's a kingdom praying element that we need to start doing if we want to have an effect on our city, on our state, on our nation. Gary Tipton, where are you? Okay, just stand up, Gary. Everybody, I want you to stare at Gary. He doesn't care. Gary is a coach and has been for years. He's used to people yelling at him and throwing things. Okay, sit down. Thank you, brother. Gary has just become uh, part of the F Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Uh, he's just started a new, new uh, chapter in his life. And he's going around from school to school all over the panhandle meeting with coaches and kids and trying to get FCA started in these schools and trying to get the coaches excited about this. And, and he, he's praying for these coaches that they'll accept Christ, these kids that they'll accept Christ. That is affecting the state of Texas and the panhandle of Texas. If you can bring these coaches to Christ, they're like evangelists because they leave and go to a new school every three years. It's like sending out missionaries everywhere. Well, why don't we as a church pray for Gary, just like Paul asked the church to pray for him? Why don't we as a church pray for Gary that God would open doors and let him talk to people we could never talk to? This is kingdom praying. Of course, you have to know I've got to tell you about this so you can do it, but I'm telling you. I want you to start praying for Gary and for the coaches and for the kids in the panhandle that God would bring them to Christ and, and a mighty move into the Spirit would happen at the top of Texas. He's in our church. This is, this is our spot where we can do kingdom praying. So five things the, we gave the kids, the five rocks. Praise, thanksgiving, confession of our sins, petition, asking, petition, asking. And then kingdom praying, intercession, but kingdom praying, something bigger than what we've got. What we're asking you to do as you go pray on our church prayer team out in the prayer house, you'll, you'll uh, miss part of the sermon 
for one Sunday, maybe out of the month or out of two months. But that's important. It's going to be important because what we're dealing with is the spiritual aspect in this kingdom praying. That's where you're touching the kingdom. That's where we're dealing with spiritual aspects. Now I'm going to stop. I've got to quit. But there's an absolute necessity for prayer, and that's what Jesus is teaching the apostles. This tremendous revival that's going on. I mean, our church is doing great. We're, I mean, we're a little short this morning, but it's, what, two weeks before school starts, and they're all trying to cram in their vacations, and I'm aware of that. We're doing good. Folks, we've got a whole town and a whole state that need Christ. We've got churches all over this town that need Christ. Churches that need Christ. And we know how to pray. And so God is calling us to conversate with Him. I'd like for you to mark one thing on your calendars, please. It's not in the bulletin, but you'll need to know it. It will be next week, but please mark it on your calendars. August the 10th, which is a Tuesday, Franklin Graham is going to have a prayer meeting in Amarillo, Texas. I don't think Franklin himself is going to be here, but his team is going to be here in Amarillo, August the 10th on Tuesday. Would you mark that down, please? August the 10th on Tuesday. It's at Grace Community Church on Western and Plains. That's where we're going to meet, and we're just going to pray. It's going to be at 630. You can come and go as you want. You can come and pray and leave. You don't have to stay for the whole thing. But we're inviting you to come and be a part of this prayer thing so that Franklin's coming across the middle of the United States and stopping to certain cities, and Amarillo's going to be one of them. But we're not just going to be praying for Amarillo. We're going to be praying for all these cities through the middle of the United States. We're going to learn how to pray. We're going to actually take time to pray. Would you mark that down, please? Would you bow with me? Ah, Lord God, Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by Thy great power. Nothing is too difficult for Thee. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Would You teach us to humble ourselves and pray and seek Your face? Lord, would You teach us what You want us to do, where You want us to go, when You want us to do it, and how to do it? Would you teach us? Lord, would you move within our hearts in this church? And would you teach us to pray? Would you teach us how to meditate, conversate with you? Oh, God, would you please teach this church to humble herself and pray? Help us, Lord. We cry out to you, oh, God, help us. And we thank you and we praise you. We pray you'd save our children. Lord, we pray you'd save our state. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.